Are we? Did we officially start? We're on. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are. If you are like Christine, who's in London, good night. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the NAHP COVID nineteen virtual symposium. And tonight we are discussing the impact on Haitian women entrepreneurs. And though the focus is Haitian women entrepreneurs, we know a lot of the information we'll be sharing tonight will be beneficial to almost everyone, right, who is in business, because we're all being impacted by this right now. So if you are watching, do share this video with someone or different groups that you may be part of that can really use the knowledge of these phenomenal women, soon to be five <laughs> women that we have on this panel, okay? So my name is Nadesh Fleurimont. And I am an entrepreneur, uh, I would say, uh, what's the word they usually use? But I just love entrepreneurship. I'm a preacher of entrepreneurship. And that's because we know that entrepreneurship drives communities. It drives economies, both internationally, both locally, your local restaurants, your local businesses, all are impacted. And this is why COVID-19 really took a toll on us. And as Haitian women, we understand and we know that if we are impacted, not only does it impact our immediate communities, but it also impacts and trickles down to Haiti, of course, right? So tonight we are here to discuss some of these important, important ramifications of COVID-19, impact lessons. And then again, we're, we're talking with, we're, we're speaking with women tonight. So we know it's not just going to be about business because as women, as we always say in our community, we are the potomitan, both on the business and financial uh, standpoint, but we're also talking about the impact on families, impact on, on our lives as mothers, and as well as the mental health impact that these last three months have had on us. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're gonna do some house cleaning, of course, because we definitely have to thank some amazing people that are making this evening possible and i don't want to miss anyone so we're definitely going to thank our sponsors or media partners um ticket magazine and i'll do this at other points throughout the evening shokayala optic 21 for better media m3e uh francesca andre photography open news and le mojo show okay and of course uh onn which is informed impact Informed, inspired, and in. So those are our media sponsors. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the NAHP for putting this phenomenal event together. Uh, of course, the chairman, Serge Grenot, and of course, the team on this event, Molina Jean Louis, Atali Cayo, and Francesca Andre, and of course, our amazing panelists. So we are going to start with, let's see, how are you ladies doing? Great. Everyone Hi. Thank you. Hi. 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 Hello. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. So as I said, I'm Nadej. I'm in New York. I run an entrepreneurship coaching business, so I work a lot with entrepreneurs. A lot of people know me in the food space because uh, I'm uh, a chef and author, cookbook author. I have a book called Haiti Uncovered, which is a coffee table cookbook about the regional cuisine of Haiti. But of course, like I said, I'm so malad about entrepreneurs and I'm like their ultimate cheerleader. So thank you NAHP for picking me to moderate this panel. Another thing, if you are watching, do hashtag NAHP COVID-19 symposium and also hashtag NAHP as well. So we can um, uh, make sure that we share your information as you're asking questions and we're able to find it as well. So let's get going. So we're going to start, we're shifting things a little bit, but we're going to start the evening with uh, Riva. Uh, uh, I will give you the way the evening will be formatted is each panelist will have about maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, we'll focus on various topics for each panelist. And then, of course, at the end of it all, we will take questions from the audience. I will have some general questions that does touch on everyone that we will ask as well. Uh, 
Miss Magali does have to leave a little bit earlier. So if you do have questions after she speak, do definitely ask them right away. You are feel free to post your questions on YouTube, Facebook, and then we have our back of the house. Well, back. I'm from the restaurant space, so I'm saying back of the house, <laughs> back, back room staff or back in staff that will definitely be gathering them to be able to share with everyone. Okay, so let's start with a quick introduction from you, Riva. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, I have your bio, but I don't like reading people's bios. I love to hear about people from their own voice and love to hear how they see themselves. So do take a couple of minutes, just tell us a little bit about who you are and the work that you do. Yes, well, good evening, everyone. Bonsoir. Thank you again so much for having me. Nadege, you look beautiful. I love this green. You look so tropical. You have that sweat behind you. You're giving me icy vibes right now. <laughs> Um, donc merci. Um, my name is Yathriva Mary Poussil. I am singer, I'm a dancer, I am a jeweler, I'm an artist, an author. I, I call myself a jack of all trades, or of many trades. Um, I grew up in Haiti, I'm high Haitian, and I'm based in Brooklyn, New York now. Um, where I live with my husband and my daughter and we have a band together. Where we perform, well, we did perform a lot, but since um, the pandemic, we've been, you know, working remotely and well, figuring things out as we go and adjusting since, you know, um, we're experts at that, just uh, making it work with what we have. And, um, yeah, during this time, I've been leaning a lot on, on um, different types of creations, but I'm not going to get into that more. But but that's um, the gist of what I do in a nutshell. Okay, thank you, Riva, for sharing that. I'm in, I'm in New York with you, so we've worked together on a lot of these different um, aspects of your life in different ways. But I think for a lot of people, they definitely knew you on the music scene, right? Um, how has COVID-19 impacted the bulk of that work and how have you had to pivot, if any? Yeah, um, when I think there's like a, um, sort of a reverberation back to me, maybe if you mute your mic while I speak, that'll um, take that problem away. Let's try that. I know some, sometimes it's, okay, a little bit better. Um, so, yes, I, I definitely did perform before, and I also taught classes, um, dance classes before the pandemic. But since we've been at home, um, I have been creating more artwork. So um, I have um, a big called ultra art, where I create um, velvet creations on canvases or on jewelry or on um, candles, more and um, that's been doing um, really well. And that sort of put me in a different space. I've been creating more and more um, artistic creations and, and also sort of flowing into this new um uh, I think is it me or is Viva experiencing some technical difficulties? Hello? Yes, I'm also afraid that I stopped hearing her. Oh, you did stop talking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she stopped talking. <laughs> That's the I'm not sure if she stopped talking or if she lost connection. She yeah. might have lost the connection. Technology yeah. has been a vital part of this pandemic, but it definitely <laughs> has been causing some 
There she is. Funny interactions lately. So we'll wait for Riva to hop back. Oh, She's hey. back. Oh, there she yeah. is. Sorry about that. Yeah, as you were saying, oh, okay. technology has been a huge part of it. And it's sort of like in control of things. As, as, as musicians, it's been really difficult. Like performances are just sort of left up to the internet gods. We have no power. Um, so that's why, you know, pre recorded is always best because you never know what's going to happen. But um, I was saying that um, I've been um, hosting a number of sort of like healing um, sessions. This is something that I've shied away from before of this time, but it seems that there was um, a demand for that. So I've done a few new moon gatherings, um, full moon gatherings. I did a bang gathering, like a bang just. Um, so that's been sort of a, also an interesting new space um, to explore, you know, all the while keeping um, Haitian culture at the base of, of all of that work. And um, yeah, I've been um, creating, <laughs> I've been working on clothes, I've been um, creating like sequined beaded um, clothing. So it, it, I've just been very creative during this time. Um, and mostly making a lot of uh, fit physical pieces, like more paintings and, and like I said, candles and, and working with different crystals. So that's been an interesting um, new wave for me, but it's been very well received and I've gotten a lot of support, a lot of love. We recently started making um, Veve t-shirts with another company that I partnered with. So um, I've been really enjoying that um, that new sort of venue, okay. mm -hmm, avenue. Okay. So as a creative entrepreneur, it seems that uh, actually having products have been a major shift in terms of how you've developed your businesses. But yeah. I guess I'll use that to say, you mentioned you've been doing certain things like healing sessions and it's, it's an aspect that you were a little reluctant. So I guess beyond that, what other, I guess, muscles, I guess that pen, the pandemic, I guess, you know, since force you to flex or force you to utilize perhaps that you were a little bit more hesitant on before and what came out of it for you? Yeah, um, well, yes, as you said, I was reluctant before to do um, to do these gatherings. I've, I've done a few sort of intimate ones amongst my friends um, before, um, but you know, the internet is an interesting space um, and it can be very, um, draining at times you have so many you know it's such a huge exchange of energy but um i felt that there was a need for it at that time like people were really looking you know um for community they were looking for these spaces where they could come together and you know sing our traditional songs and learn learn about our traditions and and, and do things sort of you know in light of you know in the same path as our ancestors the way that they would so I felt, um, you know, I tried it once and it went really well. We had about a hundred participants at the first one. And then um, I've continued, I've done a few. Um, and, and, it, and, and it involves music, it involves um, different rhythm. So it's sort of like all encompassing the various things that I do. Um, but in terms of like the products, which have been moving um, well, it, um, in that sense, as a businesswoman, I've had to, you know, implement like, <laughs> Um, obtaining enough uh, shipping materials and setting up a, a shipping system that works rather than waiting in line for hours at a time at the post office um, and, and how to stay safe while doing that and getting things to people in a timely fashion because people are at home and they're impatient. So all of these things um, have been, uh, you know, new space and challenging, but, but, but it's also something that I needed. I needed that extra boost um, and I feel that this time has really um, pushed me in that direction and I'm, I'm excited about about it um, and I'm grateful for technology because it's come in handy quite, <laughs> quite a bit. I've had to learn to master Zoom because, you know, those calls um, while I'm hosting these circles, I'm sort of like, you know, doing all the um, admin stuff behind the scenes and, and it's been a, a, a real trial and error, but um, I definitely had to get the internet upgraded, <laughs> all of those things. Okay, <laughs> I've had to so be it's, it's definitely... Go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, I was saying, so it definitely sounds like the pandemic, in a sense, pushed you to do a lot of necessary work that needed to be done as an entrepreneur. But then perhaps as a creative entrepreneur, you were not 
necessarily either didn't have the time or just was not ready to do. Like you just said a word, which I think is very important in business, which is systems, right? You use the word shipping system, but it's, these were things you were doing before, but never perhaps like, was it time that stopped you before or was it that your back was against the wall? What pushed you to do these systems? Um, well, I think that yes, time was a big part of it. Um, I think also, um, there was, you know, a slower demand because my sales were more sparse, you know, spaced out. But um, I started creating these these Veve candles around my birthday. I, I gifted it to myself at the end of March. So that was when, you know, we all started um, being in home. Um, and I posted it just sort of to share it with people. And, and I got a huge um, demand. And then I started creating them for making them for sale. So I think also exploring different products also has, you know, sort of put things into a different gear. So, and, and I think that, you know, it makes sense. Like it's all rel relative people wanting to be in community in these healing spaces. And then, you know, using these candles with our symbols on them and, and all of this, it's, it's a very difficult time for people. And, and, I, and I feel that people are really trying to connect um, in different ways. So um, maybe I feel like there's a higher demand right now for like Bebe, um, you know, spiritual tools, I would say in general. Um, so that's, that's definitely, um, and yeah, the time has, has been a big, a big help, you know, staying put and just focusing on, on implementing a better system has been really helpful. So another theme that I'm hearing and another word you're utilizing quite a bit is posting. So I'm assuming social media has been a major factor in terms of how you're doing business currently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, social media has definitely been my uh, main platform. Um, Instagram is my favorite. And um, it's it's where I make m most of my sales. Um, I was operating through a website before, but I've shifted to Instagram where I've created various pages for different crafts. So like I have a jewelry page, I have the page for the artwork, and then I have my, you know, my main um, music page. I also have the dance page. So I have four pages that I'm running. And um, people who, um, you know, request something, it's sort of, I like to keep the, um, the rapport and the interaction flowing. So it's a conversation. People can, you know, create their own custom pieces. And then it, it's not just like a click and purchase type of thing. Like I don't mm -hmm. post, you know, a number of items in pre-stock. I, I like to sort of create the piece with the person in mind. So it's still bespoke pieces. They're still, um, they still take time for them to be produced, but I'm, 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 um, have, have a better flow now where things are, being um, created and sent out. But yeah, and Instagram has been major for me. Um, definitely a lot of love on there. People repost, sharing. You've reposted myself. I've gotten sales directly from you, I would say. The day that you posted, you said, you know, um, support these um, women, Haitian women entrepreneurs. And many people came and requested things. So thank you for that. You know, um, cross promoting is has been a big one. Like um, my dear friend Paola, whenever she wears my earrings and she posts that, you know, on her on her um, personal page, I always get an influx of um, demands around that time. So supporting one another has, has been very helpful as well. Whenever someone shares my work, that's definitely um, a big boost. It's free, you know, it's free promotion. Well, not free because it's <laughs> And you're tapping into that person's network. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone exactly. who may know that person, but now that that person has recommended you, definitely makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, final question before we move on to Magali. I wanted to ask you, you are a mother, you are a wife. Mm -hmm. So how has being home, right, in your space these last three months impacted both your own sanity and i guess your own well-being because you you're big on healing you're big on spirituality but has it had any impact on you to be not be able to go out and having a little how old is Loa? she's gonna be two in august so she's she's in the terrific two phase <laughs> terrific? is that what they're calling it now <laughs> you gotta spin it <laughs> um yeah it's definitely been um it's been interesting, I would say. I'd say that at this point now, I don't even know how many days I've I have not been keeping track, but it's been months. 
Um, I definitely feel as though I've gone through all of the motions, all of the all of the waves. Um, it was harder when it first started, the adjustment, um, you know, us all being in the same space at, at the same time, you know, it's a lot of energy. Loa has a lot of energy in herself. You know, Movolino is a lot of energy in himself. I'm a lot of, so <laughs> the three of us can, you know, a um, see a lot. So um, we definitely have all gone through our, um, challenges but thankfully we're both big on communication and you know expressing ourselves if something is not going well if we're if we're frustrated about something we're both very um big communicators so that's been really helpful um right now we're in a much better place but it, yeah it was hard it's been hard for me especially as a creative you know i'm but that's how it is you know it's it's also finding that balance because if you're gonna be an entrepreneur full time if you're gonna put all your time in, how are you gonna do it really realistically you know as a mother as a wife as a sister as a daughter like you have all these relationships to tend to and you have your business to tend to and while all the while keeping it enjoyable so it's definitely been um a juggling act and 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 we've danced around all of the um all of the issues that we needed to address, all the while dealing with, you know, all of the outside factors. Um, so it's it's been heavy, but um, we've worked through everything. And, and, you know, I'm just thankful for our health. I'm thankful for family. I'm thankful that we're all okay. Like, you know, it's just like focusing on gratitude and the positive things that we do have to, you know, to look forward to every day. Um, because I know that some people have it much harder and don't have the resources and don't have the creativity or don't have a uh, bad guy. So, um, so just, you know, turning it back and yes, also turning to spirituality and making sure that I'm making time for myself also to spend time with, um, you know, just doing self-care Sunday, like really, I have an alarm on my phone. I set an alarm every Sunday at seven. It's like, do something, self-care, anything. It could be a facial, it could be a bath, it could be 10 minute meditation, whatever it is, it has to happen. I have to put whatever I'm doing aside and I have to, um, you know, be uh, diligent about that. Otherwise, you know, I beat myself up about not taking out that time. But um, but it's been it's been great and Loa is almost two. I'm sure it's so confusing for her. She doesn't speak yet. She wants to express herself. She has all these feelings. So I'm also trying to you know the understanding of of where she's coming from. And it's probably very strange. Like, you know, where's why isn't anybody coming over anymore? Like, why are we going outside? It's it's all yeah. very confusing. Um, so um, we've been just uh, managing it and, and and thank you, you know, for all of your support also throughout this time. Because we love, for example, doing that cooking show with you, which was out of our, um, not comfort zone, but we don't, it's not something we've ever done, but we cook at home all the time. And it's something that we wanted to start doing. So, you know, also getting that ball rolling has been has been great. I've been trying to encourage Mavalino to do more stuff like that. So, yes. Awesome, awesome. It seems like you definitely have... Um, I wouldn't say mastered, but definitely have gotten a lot out of this experience in terms of pushing yourself into mm -hmm. certain territories and realms that perhaps you needed to get to, but perhaps were reluctant to for whatever reason. So thank you for sharing uh, that with us. Um, yeah. Magali, how are you? Magali, can you hear me? It was muted. So yes. Hi, I'm well, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm, so I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Magali, give us a little bit brief one to two minute introduction uh, about who you are, what you do, and uh, all that sure. good stuff. Sure. We'll get to the yeah. questions. So, um, born in Haiti, my family left in the 60s. I grew up in Queens. So I'm a New York City, Queens girl, have lived all over, went to law school in New Orleans. And for the last um, seven years, I've been working in the economic empowerment, equity and justice space. I'm an attorney. So equity and justice has been something that I've always been interested in. And combining it with economic empowerment is something, it's just a dream come true for me because I really believe that freedom comes with through economic empowerment. 
and to be working in communities of color is just a dream. Okay. And I'm also so the mother. I'm in New York. Um, my, you know, I I live between New York and Miami. I'm the mother of four adult girls, so um, girl power is really big for me. <laughs> okay, and what's your current role for our viewers? Sure. So I'm a senior advisor to Mayor de Blasio, and I am the director of the Office of um, Minority and Women Business Enterprises in New York. Okay. So then that flows us right into our initial question. Could you please break down the overall goal of that office? Sure. And sure. So the goal of the office is basically to increase contracting opportunities for MWBEs in New York City, right? Um, right from the beginning, the mayor was has been very open about his commitment to economic justice and equity in New York City. And so he's really focused on contracting opportunities for MWBEs. And that's because we believe, and also research has shown that government procurement is a tool that can be utilized to fight income inequality. It spurs economic opportunity for MWBEs because MWBEs turn around and invest in their own local communities and it addresses this persistent racial wealth gap that we have in this country. Um, so my office is responsible for developing policy for MWBEs and also we coordinate among all of the city agencies. I don't know if you guys know, but the city has almost a hundred agencies that do a number of different things. We have oversight over the city's MWBE program. And my office essentially serves as a one-stop shop for MWBEs who are interested in doing business with the city and its agencies. We facilitate that. And in 2016, when uh, Mayor de Blasio created my office, he, um, first of all, he, he leveraged city resources and he set a variety of really ambitious goals for us. Where we came from is so far from the goals that he set. He actually said he wants at least 30% of all contracts to go to MWBEs. At the time, it was under 15%. And um, he also wanted, he tasked us with awarding $25 billion to MWBEs by fiscal year 2025. 20, and he wanted us to certify 9,000 um, MWBEs. So um, I'm happy to share with you that, first of all, for the first time in city history since the MWBE program has been around for 20 years, for the first time this year, we've, we we um, met that goal. So we're at 30% as a city, which is incredible. And um, we've awarded almost $15 billion to MWBEs since 2015, and we've certified almost 10,000 MWBEs. So we're really proud of our achievement. And um, in addition to that, our sister agency, the New York City Department of Small Business Services provides a number of capacity building programs and resources for small businesses and it's something that we encourage all of our MWBEs to take advantage of. And over the last year, actually, now we've started, um, we've expanded our services to include new economy and business development initiatives. Basically, we're looking to see um, what the city really buys and develop MWBEs to, pr pr to produce those goods. And then we're also exploring a transnational business program and exploring um, public-private partnerships. So we're really excited. A lot going on. That's phenomenal. And I think a lot of people don't know about uh, uh, the, uh, the mayor's office of MWBE. So can you please give us a little bit of information in terms of, let us say you're a woman-owned business or operated business. You know, women, how do you start the process of becoming certified? So um, the New York City Department of the certification arm for um, the city of New York. And I, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but the process is you reach out and they will have somebody to you to help you through the process. 
they, you know, first of all, they have to prove that you are either or a woman owned and business entity. And then you have to have been in business in the state area for at least a year. Mm -hmm. And they also, you know, they do some background check, but it's it, it's not a process. And there are a lot of um, support services available to help you through the certification process. process. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. I think sometimes it's true because a lot of people get overwhelmed. They're thinking it's the government that it takes. It's impossible, but there are a lot of there. There is actually, you said, a department that actually assists you with it. Oh, absolutely. And they have they have technical assistance to help you through every step of the process. Okay. So what specific post-COVID initiatives have been implemented, if any, by the mayor's office as to support women and minority-owned businesses? So one of the things that one of the first things that we've done over the last almost, I guess, three months now is we've worked with our um, sister agencies. Um, so first of all, let me go back and say, so not all of the agencies are procuring services, right? When, once we went on pause, a number of agencies stopped their procurement process. Yes. And everybody started focusing on COVID-related procurements only. For example, my former position was with the New York City Department of Design and Construction, which serves as the capital construction manager for the city of New York. Construction was on pause, except for emergency construction, which is COVID related. So all the procurements were only COVID related procurements. So we, we started working with the handful of agencies who were procuring COVID related services and implementing an MWBE first policy. Meaning that what we did is we worked with the agencies to say, hey, Whatever you need, if there's an MWBE that provides that service, we want to go to that MWBE first. So you have to show, you have to prove to us that there are no MWBEs who provide that service before you move on to an, a non-MWBE. So that, I think that's been the most important thing that we've done. We've also assisted some um, minority and women-owned businesses in pivoting, right? Because a lot of times you in order to, to survive and like Riva was saying, I mean, she, her example was a, a, the best example of the ability to pivot to supplying whatever the needs, the current needs are. So we assist um, companies in pivoting in terms of what they're, you know, what they're supplying us. So for example, a construction company that we used to work with since construction was shut down, was able to turn around and um, provide deep cleaning san and sanitizing services. And we helped them through that pivot so that they could still have income com coming through and, um, you know, and, and stay alive. And we also have been matchmaking, you know, agencies reach out to us and say, hey, we need this. And we match them up with MWBEs. So, those are some of the things that we've been doing. And, you know, um, over the last two and a half months, we have 510 MWBEs who were awarded contracts for a total value of $366 million. Wow. Okay. So I have a question. We have some questions that are coming in from the audience. And I guess my question to you, my final question on my end is, what advice would you give to Haitian American business owners that to ensure that they are taking full advantage of these resources and programs offered by your office. Sure. So the first, you know, the first thing is to find out, you know, whatever business that you have, is that something that the city of New York procures, right? Because if it's not a service or a product that we buy, then certification is not very helpful to you because you're going to certify and you're not going to get any contracts. But if you do determine that it is something that we do buy. So, for example, there are a variety of professional services that we procure. Um, it's human services, you know, like um, mental health services and counseling. Um, um, we also, you know, engin engineering, architects, attorneys. We contract professional services, construction services. 
client and community-based services, um, workforce training, you know, senior centers, if if and also all sorts of goods like Department of Education has their their budget is the largest budget in the city and they procure food, they procure bus drivers, buses, all sorts of stuff. So you have to find out whether your business is compatible with what the city buys. And if you make the determination that it is, then I certainly would counsel you to certify. Once you certify, there's a one-stop website, and I will include it in, in the comments, that you register and you can find all of the procurement opportunities available with the city in that one space. It's incredible. And then I would also um, suggest that you take advantage of all of the technical support services that Small Business Services offers, whether it's you know accounting or financial services we provide. We also have a, um, a program where if you have a contract with the city, you can get a loan. And if it's COVID related contract, you can get a loan of up to a million dollars at 0% interest. So um, I would encourage everybody to take advantage of all of those programs. Okay, sounds good. We had a couple of questions from the audience for you. One, one right now is, is this only for New York based businesses? So it's so you have to the rule is that you have to have a presence in New York, and New York is considered not only the five boroughs but um, Suffolk County, Nassau County. There are some boroughs in, um, in New Jersey and Connecticut also. So it's the tri-state area. Okay, and another question is: What makes this unique time in history an opportune time to start a business for those who may be considering entrepreneurship? especially for women considering business. This is from Sarah. Sure, so uh, you wouldn't think that this is a great time. This is an, actually a, a fantastic time because I think not only government, but also um, private industries coming to find out that a diverse, not only a diverse workforce, but a diverse business society is something that is really beneficial. So. I believe we're gonna come into a time where we're gonna have corporations who are invested in um, minority businesses and they're gonna invest in their supplier diversity. Um, New York City, just like New York State, is completely invested in diversifying their contractor, the, the people that they do business with. And I think it's gonna become even more important, especially black and brown owned businesses and women and you know and black and brown women owned businesses okay thank you so much magali we'll see if there's any more questions uh but thank you so much for your time i know you have to go exactly at 7 30 but do stick around in case some more questions come around in the next few minutes in the meantime we'll move over to miss christine Soufran. i never know how to say that so please correct me um but yes Christine, please give us a little bit of introduction about yourself. I always read this part of your bio that says you're a startup ecosystem expert for emerging markets. And for the non-tech person or none, you know, uh, who's not well versed in that market, I'm always like, what exactly does that mean? So please introduce yourself and give us a little bit of uh, information in terms of the work you're doing and we'll move on to questions. Sure, thank you so much. So you actually oh. said it really well, Christine Sufra and Tim. So I know for the Tukmun Kon Pati Sufra, the Tim, that Ghanaian side, my husband's side, <laughs> there's always a, a struggle on that part, but thank you so much um, for sharing. It's all about culture, right? And I think that feeds into what I do as an entrepreneur, when you said, you know, I'm a tech ecosystem builder for emerging markets, Haiti is an emerging market. When you think about where people define the future for thinking tech companies or startup companies, people usually look at Silicon Valley, New York, London. They think about these Western markets, but quite frankly, we've been creating 
amazing businesses and pioneering companies from Haiti, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya. We, we have African roots as Haitians and there's a lot of billion dollar companies mm -hmm. coming out of Africa right now. And so um, even though my work is always grounded into being Haitian, a lot of people know me as the founder of Haiti Tech Summit, which is the biggest tech conference, not only in Haiti, but the entire Caribbean. You guys probably have seen Google come to Haiti because of the Haiti Tech Summit. Facebook has come to Haiti because of Tech Summit. We're actually the reason why Haiti has Airbnb, by the way. We brought Airbnb um, to Haiti Tech Summit. Um, it let them have a meeting with the Ministry of Tourism. And that was a five-year contract that kicked off the Airbnb platform in Haiti. If you think about our tourism um, ecosystem in Haiti, we have less than 5,000 hotel rooms. And we all know in the Caribbean, our tourism sector is a very crucial part of economic development. So to have Airbnb come to Haiti and have now people have private access um, to people's homes, because we all know they won't study it. I see sometimes they have negative connotations. Now you're able to come into someone's home in Port au Prince, say mock, and all these different places and see the lens of Haiti through the eyes of a Haitian person. It completely adds a new story and a narrative about Haiti. And so for me, you know, I've been starting this work for several years, actually. Um, even though Haiti Tech Summit is probably one of the biggest summit that a lot of people in the Haitian community know me for, we actually run these tech summits around the world. Um, this year, we had 54 tech summits scheduled around the world. Last year, I did 23 tech summits. Um, 10 of those tech summits was across Africa. So we did a major tech summit with the government of Nigeria in Ghana. We had 3,000 people come to Ghana uh, for the tech summit there. We did a summit in Kenya, South Africa. We even did tech summits in Dubai, Saudi Arabia. So this is something I've been doing for years. And the reason why it's been so important to me is because I believe that we have to have a more um, loving and if not powerful understanding of the role that businesses, small businesses and startups play in any economy. Because we all know even the US economy is run by small businesses, is run by startups. Either the startups are disrupting the industry and redefining how we see the future, or the small businesses are the ones that's employing the workforce that make a country stand. And when you look at Haiti, we may not see the small business sector in the same way, but you know, Munka Vanilai, all the street vendors. My mother was a street vendor, by the way. My grandmother was a street vendor. You take one Semak and you know, in Port-au-Prince in the central area. That's what gives, keeps Haiti going. And so these are the ecosystems that I work on, you know, as the chief marketing officer of the Global Star Ecosystem. And we've been doing this for years. We're now six years running um, in terms of doing these programs around the world, but five years is when we celebrate our official date this year. And it's been amazing to like now, as of last year, 75,000 people have been to our tech summits around the world. And we've met with celebrities like Jack Dorsey, to Bill Gates, to Tim Draper, to you know celebrity icons and heads of states. I deal with presidents on a regular basis, shakes from Dubai and the Middle East. And it's all about driving a new narrative about Haiti. Everyone knows I'm crazy about Haiti and not just you know the negative side that people talk about Haiti. And I'm like, this is the first black republic. But beyond that, there's a lot of countries that owe their existence to Haiti. And there's a lot of like vitality about the country that I try to bring to lot. And I've been doing that through technology. Who would have thought through this pandemic, technology is probably gonna be the saving grace of countries like Haiti. Because right now we're realizing if you did not put tech first, if you were not digital first, a lot of businesses are shutting down because they thought tech was just a side effect. That I'll get to the tech later, I'll get to the digital later. Now you have no choice. I'm seeing events. A lot of people didn't appreciate events. When we did Haiti Tech Summit 2017, 83 million people viewed Haiti Tech Summit live. When you Google Haiti, you saw images of the summit. Now all these events are going online. People say it's just an event, but what an event does, events drives economies. You're seeing the Olympics, and what that has done for an entire country. You're seeing major operations across Hollywood and across businesses. So now we're seeing the power of events and bringing people together. We're a society that needs to build and bring people together in the same place to build economies. So, so I'm very proud to see how many event organizers are going virtual, how many people are figured out Zoom. I'm seeing the government are doing press conferences on Zoom, on Google Hangout. There's so much that's happening in Haiti and countries like Haiti. And I'm so proud to be a part of that narrative of bringing these um, platforms and countries online. 
Okay, no, that's amazing. That's amazing. So now let's talk about that. That shift, right? That shift from these in-person events that you travel for that were in person that you were bringing these companies to actually touch the grounds of these countries and experience it now to being virtual what is the ramification of that and what's the impact of that and what are the pros and cons of doing it virtually yeah i think that's a money making question right now with everything grounded until the end of the year and i want to be very clear because because i work with tech summits in multiple countries i deal with visa ministry of tourism uh ministry of business so i deal with a lot of government sectors so we get the information ahead of time keep in mind haiti tech summit was the first event to announce in the country that was going to postpone its event to october before everyone thought it was going to make sense because keep in mind in march when we announced that we were postponed to um, October, people thought it was premature because there was an assumption, let's get your back, guys' mindset back to pre-COVID when we now are normalizing this reality. Everything felt like it was gonna go back to normal by June and the summer. Here we are in June and the economy still has not reset. And if anything, a lot of economies that are hurting worse than countries that you would expect are in Western markets, the US, the UK. China, where a lot of companies, a lot of events used to happen, now people are looking at Africa and the Caribbean to resource. So this is a very important time uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs in Haiti, especially across the diaspora, to tap into what's happening in Haiti right now, because right now we're seeing local manufacturing go up. We're seeing local produce go up. I know many of the entrepreneurs in the uh, call to speak to that, that because we don't have this international flow, a lot of countries had to go back to the basics and build locally, scale locally, because that's all you have right now. And so going back to your question about this whole digitization of events, you're seeing webinars go virtual, you're seeing summits go virtual. And what's gonna happen right now is, for the rest of the year, you're gonna see a hybrid. From now until September, everything has gone virtual because we don't have a choice. This fall is going to be a very important time, a very important quarter of the year where a lot of event organizers have to make the sound decision of either to go virtual or to maintain a live event. Regardless of the decision that event organizers make in the fall, you need to be prepared actually not for this fall, but 2021 and 2022. The new normal is that you all know it takes three weeks to develop a habit. And so we already, as a society, have been normalized for virtual mm -hmm. conferences and virtual engagements. So you're going to yeah. have to figure out the new normal for organizing gatherings beyond this year. And this is something that's going to last decades to come as we're realizing that people are able to monetize online. People are able to connect online. Now, keep in mind, people are still going to want to connect in person. That will never go away. And I think there's a big debate happening in the event ecosystem as to what the new future is going to be. But I think the more important question is, how are you as an individual going to prepare for this digital first reality? Because I think as entrepreneurs, you know, my company, the Global Startup Ecosystem, we've been digital first since our inception. Before we started running tech summits, we were actually hosting digital accelerator program. And for those of you who don't know what an accelerator program is, it's pretty much a multi-week program that you do um, to help entrepreneurs get access to resources, mentors, and speakers. Back in 2015, I did a digital accelerator for the Caribbean. Why did I do it for the Caribbean? Because I was pissed off. I was tired of the fact that everyone was talking about entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley in the U.S., not everyone in Haiti and Jamaica and Barbados could pack up their bags and move to Silicon Valley and build a tech company. That event, that program that we did digitally for an accelerated program in 2015 went viral to Middle East, to Africa, and Europe. That first year, we selected 500 companies from 63 countries to do a digital accelerated program. The following year, we had 750 companies. Now, as of this year, we select a thousand companies from nine different countries through our virtual accelerator program. So we were doing digital activities for three years before we launched Haiti Tech Summit in 2017, which grew into 11 summits in 2018, to 23 summits last year, and 54 tech summits that are both virtual and live that we're doing this year. So when you think about the evolution, it's because we were thinking about the future being virtual in combination with the in-person. And I think a lot of people are gonna have to figure out how do you wanna build your personal brand and your expertise on online? I'm seeing my mom 
who barely knew how to open a computer three years ago has more Facebook followers than myself. And I consider myself a personal branding expert. Why? Because she's realized <laughs> that even as a person who was in her late 50s, that she needs to understand social media. Every generation needs to understand this digital first. Our first speaker just talked about the fact that she doesn't even base her revenue from a website. She bases it on Instagram. That's the new normal where you're going to have to figure out how do I create a digital career, a digital business, a digital brand to last. And this COVID-19, I think it's probably the biggest worldwide experiment we have ever witnessed in our entire lifetime. I, You know, as Haitians, we're very close to our elders. Very, very close to our elders. So when I talk to my grandma and my grandpa and my aunties and uncles, like, have you experienced something like this before? They said, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen two recessions back to back. Don't forget, we just came out of a 2008 recession. And by the way, when it comes to unemployment, unemployment is through the roof. And keep in mind, because of the unemployment we experienced in 2008, America, 30% of the economy started scaling up a freelance economy. So even America doesn't have enough jobs back in 2008. So people became freelancers. You see a lot of solo entrepreneurs were scaling in 2008. Now we have a second recession three years later. So once again, you see another scale up. So I'm, what I'm looking at is seeing how is Haiti going to replicate that mentality instead of just thinking about how do we build jobs locally, how we digitize the workforce to see that the future is digital and getting people to build their ideas and their brands online. So that's what I'm looking at as an event organizer and bringing those inf that information that I feel like everyone's having in those special rooms behind the scenes and making it public so that way everyone's informed with the same equipment of information. No, for sure. I know I'm one of those people. I'm like, I'm never leaving my house again because I don't need to. <laughs> Because I definitely enjoyed watching a ball online, you know, because I don't usually go in person anyways. So now that I have the option, I'd much rather send you $20 to stay in my house than put on clothes, put on heels, go through the bad weather and actually see certain shows, right? Mm -hmm. There's certain things, of course, like you said, we'll still want to interact. But I really have been thinking about it because I'm just like, I just saw how my social media following just went through the roof and interaction just because I was engaging more in social media. So I'm, it got me thinking as a business person, what do I need to do and what do I need to continue doing? Now, as it relates to Haiti Tech Summit, you mentioned October is still in the roster for a live event, correct? Yes. Okay. So are you thinking about that hybrid of, 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 moving forward in terms of like because you're already in the tech space so you know the necessity of it but how do you i guess foresee what is your i guess uh forecast in terms of what needs to be done for future both for yourself and other future event producers yeah so you know i think for me one of the mediums i do to bring value one of the things i consider myself to be an expert in is being a galvanizer i like to bring people together whether that's through events whether that's through accelerators whether that's through you know um ecosystem you know um, um opportunities i like to bring people together and one of the mediums that we do that is through the tech summit and one thing i would say is I think this year, because it's the first year, we're still going to have a live program, you know, because obviously one of the biggest um, narrative shifts that we're trying to have for people is having locals see the beauty of the country from a business perspective, because the locals are there. They experience the hardships and benefits of being business owners in Haiti, right? But also internationals who don't really understand uh, the potential of the country and getting them to see that. I do believe that we'll have a virtual component to Haiti Tech Summit of this year for those who are not comfortable traveling, because again, we're the biggest event in the country. And so it takes six figures to host Haiti Tech Summit every single year. Um, so this is not a, you know, event. And a lot of people, when we first did the Tech Summit, said that you're not going to have local producers, local photographers, local stage managers. All of our vendors are local. And so this is a big, um, you know, economic opportunity for a lot of our local vendors that we work with when it comes to hosting this program. So we're still going to have a live virtual component, um, but we're also going to have a virtual side for those who want to tap into the summit. But more importantly, one of the questions 
um, that you asked about, you know, how does someone even create a virtual experience? experience? Again, just because Haiti is not going to be a live virtual experience, it's still going to be a live program. I've hosted mega virtual events already. Uh, one of the biggest events we hosted this year was Her Future Summit. We had a hundred speakers from around the world, including Sophia, the celebrity robot that you saw got a Saudi citizenship. We had the U.S. ambassador to South Africa. We had heads of state, we had um, officials and corporate um, people from Mastercard, Forbes. Everyone knows I have big name corporate brands. I work with about 140 corporate brands from around the world: LinkedIn, Google, Facebook, Xerox, all of them, and. Literally, guess how many people joined us for this summit? Virtually, 2,200 people joined us online for the largest virtual summit event for women entrepreneurs in March of this year. So just because we have the capacity to do a mega virtual event, you still have to make your value proposition as to what is the biggest value for the country and the audience that you serve. And also safety-wise, you have the accountability and the responsibility to make sure that the citizens and your participants are well taken care of. And those are the decisions that we're making for Haiti Tech Summit and the events that we're doing around the world. But what we've been doing in the meantime, I think there's a big thing where event organizers have to define their value once again, which is why I applaud AAHP for, I know your event is usually in November every year, I've spoken at that event. You're not idle. You're still creating mediums for people to come together, connect, empower each other, and influence each other. Right now, as we speak, I'm running four major global digital accelerator programs, one with Forbes Magazine. Forbes Magazine, we brought them to Nigeria for the first time, right? Doing a major digital accelerator program where they had over 5,000 entrepreneurs from across Nigeria apply with like the 200 companies. And now everyone's talking about Forbes Magazine and how they're building the entrepreneurial landscape in that country. I'm also doing a major, and this is, by the way, if you guys didn't announce, uh, hear about this, during the press conference last week, we're launching Haiti's first national career accelerator program to get people to see the local talent where we're dealing with the unemployment crisis in Haiti, where we're trying to train anyone who's unemployed, local citizens of Haiti, and giving them access to remote internships and jobs at Google, Facebook, and Haitian businesses. Wow. So if there's any diaspora businesses on this session right now, go to HaitiTechSummit.com. You'll see more information about how you can hire a local Haitian citizen for your business. Because right now, everything is digital first. But you no longer need to say that, oh, I need to just tap into my local community or just the local talent that you have. Mm -hmm. Your talent could go global. Why not start with our own Haitian brothers and sisters on that talk? So that's something that we've been doing. But I'll end by saying on that question, I think for me as an entrepreneur is being very creative and intuitive about what am I creating for my customers. For those of you on the phone who are other business owners, make sure you're thinking about either your digital products that you're creating. Are you creating digital ebooks? A lot of you are business owners. You could condense all the knowledge you have and create a digital ebook and sell that online right now and get some extra cash. Digital webinars, you can host them for free and then say, you know what, if you want access to this forever, you can pay for this activity and get access to it on demand. You need to start thinking of your digital product strategy right now because, again, the new normal is not going to change. And, of course, your digital brand, taking that time to build that digital presence so people see that consistency over time. So when things do open up, people remember you for what you created during this digital and crazy unprecedented time. I don't know if you had a follow-up question. Are you all able to hear me? Yep. Are you all able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, yep. I was having a hard time hearing you, unfortunately. We hear you. I'm not sure if it was my internet. Uh, I have mm -hmm. a final question. I think we just lost, lost her there. But one thing I will say while we wait for her to come back on, okay. um, there was a comment here about, you know, what people are doing to get prepared for this COVID-19 crisis. I already talked about creating digital products for your business. A second thing that I feel like us as black entrepreneurs and Haitian Caribbean entrepreneurs that we don't leverage is applying to all these grants, 
all these loans that has been announced. There's a lot of corporate programs that are being announced every single day, a $10 trillion fund, a $100 million fund, a $2 trillion fund. And I don't see enough patient entrepreneurs applying to this program because a lot of times we say, well, maybe my taxes is not in order. Maybe my business books are not in order. I think we need to have a big announcement about pushing people to apply to this program. Go to sba.gov because this is probably an opportune time for you to be applying to disaster loans, PPE loans, these grants. I think we need to have a very hard line conversation that these programs and opportunities, what they were created to target, a lot of us are not leveraging. So we need to have a big conversation that during this time, as you create to reinvent yourself as a business owner and creating these digital products, that you're also just applying, even if you get rejections, apply to these loans, apply to these grants, get your name out there, get the application out there. Because one win, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 could go a long way during this pandemic. And that's something I just want to make sure I, I highlighted um, for those who are business owners on this session. I see you're back. Yeah, because um, both, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think I lost the connection. But both through the government and again, unfortunately, but one of the things that have come out of the Black Lives Matter movement in this time we're living in is these opportunities, whether it's through other businesses that are looking for ways to partner with us, with women, with Black uh, black owned businesses, and it's really taking advantage of those. But one last question for you, Christine, before we move on to Corinne, I wanted to ask you, you are in the digital tech space, and we basically have been living in it, so you're probably well versed. But did COVID nineteen blindside you in any way, and what did you come out of it with? No, actually, you know, remember I said originally our company was always digital first. To be frank with mm -hmm. you, it's actually helped us, um, and I'll explain mm -hmm. why. It's because you know, first and foremost, when we were running these digital accelerators for the Caribbean, for Africa. Unfortunately, we deal with this imposter syndrome where a lot of, you know, Western powers that be tend to be condescending. Oh, you're just creating a digital accelerator program because maybe you don't have the finances to do an incubator program in New York. or the, Even though we have New York offices, we're based out of New York. But there's this perception that we're creating a digital um, platform, a program that's because it's the cheaper alternative. What they didn't realize is that we were creating the future alternative. Right, way before we were ready, uh, right? And so for us, it's actually scaled us as a company. We're actually increasing hiring effort um, because we've been overwhelmed. Again, we're working with corporate and government. We're actually helping governments retrain their citizens. Can you imagine that? That I have government entities reaching out to me to help me retrain their citizens for the remote workforce of the future. I never would have thought I would be in a position where I'm getting government contracts, corporate contracts, six-figure contracts, to help retrain for tech talent, retrain entrepreneurs, and prepare people for the digital age. I'm doing big um, multi-week accelerated programs on personal branding, because a lot of people know I have a lot of crazy digital hacks to help people build their digital brands during this time. So the COVID-19 really helped our business actually scale. And one thing I would say as a business, for the first time, you could look as big as a corporate entity. Because guess what? Those big century-old organizations are using the same tool that you're using to get to your customers, Zoom, and all these different mediums. Even right now, this medium that NAHP is using, LinkedIn just did a major conference that I spoke at last week, and they used the same StreamYard medium to host the session. And this is LinkedIn, a major corporation. So this has been a time where even if you weren't ready for it, embrace it because one thing that we know about the energy and we as Haitians we know we came into existence because we put our energy out there first and that's why we became the first black republic come I see we put our mentality in the positive direction that you may not have been prepared for it but God prepared you for this moment and make sure you get your business ready and say hey I may not have been ready to like you know lose all the contracts that I was prepared for because it was supposed to be in this way but I could pivot, I could adjust. Let me create digital products. Let me start doing digital sessions. Let me start, you know, documenting. And one thing that we've been doing heavily is being very clear, because this is probably the only time you have in a long time to stay still, which means you have time to reflect. You have time to redefine. You have a lot of time to experiment. One of the previous speakers talked about all the new products. We have a session every Friday 
We announced new products that we're just piloting for our customers. This is something we never have the bandwidth to do where every week we can announce, like, hey, we're doing this new digital product. Let us know your reactions. Even if you have five to 10 customers, those five to 10 customers easily be, become hundreds of customers by the end of the month. And so we're realizing that now people are also more vulnerable and more empathetic. Now as a business, if you're pivoting 10 times in a month, people understand and are following you and able to support you through that journey. So this is probably a great time for business owners and entrepreneurs take the leap of faith and just go out there with everything because you just don't know what's going to really pinpoint your customer base in a unique way and right now let me tell you something if you're silent as a business owner because you're overwhelmed it's going to hurt you right because right now people are looking at business owners who are consistent who are out there and creating value despite the challenges times because no one's going to say that because you didn't have the time or no one's going to say it's because you didn't understand what was happening. You just need to put yourself out there and as Haitian businesses, we've been through all of it before. And so for us, it's been a great opportunity for us for COVID-19. Of course, it's unfortunate that it had to be a tragedy like this for us to be in a space where we are able to appreciate our family. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I have two kids. One that's four, one that's two. So I have the terrible twos happening right now, or terrific twos as they call it. And I'm homeschooling my kids, balancing cooking and being a mom and balancing my business that is scaling right now. My husband's business is also scaling because he's in the mental health and investment space. So there's a lot of changes happening. But I think once we create mm -hmm. that mentality of just getting ready for it and getting excited for it and not, you know, and going through the emotions and accepting it. It helped us a lot during this pandemic. And I, I challenge any entrepreneur to really take that time to do that. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to Corinne. Can you hear me now, Corinne? Oh, I can't hear you. Are you guys able to hear her? Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Do you hear me now? Oh, yes. Now I can. Okay, excellent. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> go ahead and please introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background and a little tell us a little bit about uh, your company, Askanya. Sure. And again, thank you, Riva and Christine, for the great presentation. My name is Corinne Joachim Sano Simiet. I have like my mom, my dad, and my husband last name. It makes it long, but it makes everyone happy. Um, I actually grew up in <laughs> Haiti. Um, I had a beautiful upbringing, but I was always aware of the poverty, of the fact that you had to kind of help the housekeeping staff with school fee or medical help uh, or medical fee or if there was an emergency. So I said when I grew up, I will not just be doing charity, I will create jobs. So anyone who wants money from me had to come and work for me. I'm just not going to be giving money in front of churches. So fast forward 15 years later, um, I had um, I finished my high school in Haiti. I came to the U.S. I obtained my industrial engineering degree from the University of Michigan, and I got an MBA from the Wharton School. I worked both as an engineer for um, home, um, for home health food for L'Oreal, and I was also a consultant. And I don't know if you can call it like um, the crisis of the 30s, but because I wasn't 40, but it was more like okay, I've done all these things in my life. How about creating jobs in Haiti now? So I kind of use all these different puzzles that I had created in terms of like education, work experience, and be like, okay, what job will I be creating in Haiti? And I wanted my business to have three main impact. I wanted it first to create blue, I mean, um, job for farmers because many of our people in the countryside are subsistence farmers, which means they have a little bit of everything, they eat it but they try to sell the rest, but because of lack of infrastructure, lack, lack of road, and also the fact that all their neighbors have the same thing, they don't find an outlet for their crop. So I wanted my business to create an outlet for a Haitian crop or several Haitian crops. The other thing is I wanted to create blue collar jobs because all you like um, Nadege, you went to Colombia, um, Viva, you went to Loyola in New Orleans. We all have these, and of, of course, you too, you, you also, you, are, you have a PhD. So um, um, in, in health, 
Um, so we all have education, we're all educated, but it's only 4% of the Haitian population that has a four year degree. So I wanted to create blue collar jobs um, so that um, young adults who are willing to work had uh, could use their, their hands to work, and even though if they were not educated like us. And the third thing I wanted to do is to create opportunity outside of Port-au-Prince. I mean, we call it like Republic de Port-au-Prince, the Republic of Port-au-Prince, because everything is concentrated in Port-au-Prince. So, um, so I, um, the business I created had to be outside. So with these three main point, or um, these three main goals, I see them switching different crops, mango, orange, tomato, very, very, uh, when I got to Orange, I thought about uh, a juice transformation plant, and that was too much in terms of because I was financing it. It was a million dollar investment, and I didn't have a million dollars. And so I found out about cacao, and I learned that Haitian cacao was among the top 50 in the world, that high end chocolates here in France, such as Bona, Valhona, were using it to do the chocolate bars. And I don't know if you've seen the Bona Bar Haiti, it has a pink package and it sells for 20 bucks. So I thought, okay, how about if we do the same thing in Haiti so that we can have a finished product that is made in Haiti and that is said made in Haiti because there are very few products other than Babanku or Rebo that has a label made in Haiti. So yeah, so that's how we got started. And now it's five years later. Um, we work with about 700 farmers now, between cacao farmers, sugar farmers for the rapadou, the autumnal cane sugar that we use, the lime for the lime um, farmers that we get from Yabel, which also women own. Um, you probably know Regine view that. And um, we export also, like some of, I mean, right now almost we've, we pivoted from selling 70% of our product in Haiti to only selling less than 10% right now. We've been selling through um, our bars to, I mean, three main channels, um, our website, um, stores who carry our product. We have about 40 stores between Haiti, the US and Canada. And also through events that we've been attending, like we've been doing the Salon du Chocolat in Paris, in New York, the Northwest Chocolate Festival in DC, I mean, in Seattle, the DC Chocolate Festival. So yeah, that's where, I am five years ago, five years later with Ascania. Okay, beautiful, beautiful journey, beautiful story. So now can you talk a little to... um, louder? I'm sorry, Nadish. Oh, you can, can hear you me. Talk a little louder. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, I do. Okay. So, how has this pandemic impacted your business? Because you're in production, you have employees, you have staffing, you have a supply chain, you have transport. Talk to us a little bit of pre-COVID, during COVID, and what does it look like? So pre-COVID, so pre we we're reaching our fourth to fifth year anniversary. So I would say like, as a business woman or a business based in Haiti, we had like different type of challenge. First, it was making sure the business was running fine, that we have all the ingredients, all the material, everything we needed um, in order not to ever stop. So we kind of mastered this, making sure we could produce. The next thing was in terms of transit, like making sure we're able to ship from Wanamed, because we're in Wanamed, in Northeast Haiti, close to the border with ER. So making sure we're able to ship and chocolate milk. So we were able to ship from Wanamed to Port-au-Prince and then from Wanamed to the US to our warehouse in port So that was our second milestone. Then the third milestone was more like getting more clients. Um, first in Haiti, that thing being as the, the food been devaluating and all we decided to really focus on the export because this way we're bringing back money and US dollar to Haiti. So finding client like stores, um, improving our website, making sure that we had like these, these three sales option. And we were doing pretty good. We had a uh, a small to medium sized retailer who was considering carrying Ascania in their 25 stores throughout the US. That's where we were pre COVID, where we were doing about, so we were going to expand in terms of store carrying our chocolate. We were doing like four to six events every month. Um, and also, we were set on our website. So that will be pre COVID, like March. Um, and also, we had our our supply chain in terms of shipping the chocolate in. 
So pre-COVID, so now COVID arrived. The good thing for us is that we're able to get our last call go like on the day, um, March 18, when the Haitian government decided to lock the country. So at least we have chocolate here available. Like I think our call go was on the last flight out of the country. Um, one of the last one at least. So I think we have chocolate here. And as I said, we had three men still channel. Of course, there were no more events and there were no more stores. All the stores were, were closed. So we were really relying on our online digital sales. And as um, Christine said, that forced us to really push the digital side and also reaching out to our, our sales, our, our, um, our customer base to be like, okay, we still have chocolate available and you purchasing is also having a great chocolate, but also helping us with our, well, with, with keeping the business running. Um, the second thing I would say that affected was our employee because we had to do social distancing. So what we decided to do is send them on vacation for three weeks. So instead of just sending them home with nothing, I mean, Comes, you get pity group, they have family to support, they have things to do. So since we officially take vacation in August, I'm like, okay, just take three week vacation, you still get the money, so you don't need to go out and go find another source of revenue while you're supposed to be distancing, social distancing. As we internally thought about, okay, how will we work the after COVID? So after these three weeks that put us in April, we started, we kind of distributed the work so that one person will not be meeting others. Of course, we have we had masks, make sure they had masks work, make sure we have extra like cleanup, extra um, hand sanitizing, extra cleanup. So production has been, when production resume, it's been going fine and we didn't encounter anyone being sick, so that's good. Um, so the third thing was transit because like luckily, um, how does it? I would say like Chicago transit hasn't stopped um, during that COVID situation. So there was still cargo coming and leaving Haiti, like this cargo flight. So we were able to get chocolate, but it was taking longer at custom, for instance. It was taking longer at both custom, the Haitian custom and the US custom. Well, it was taking longer because there were like some, some details that we had to iron during the process. So we, we we started getting more sales and of course the black Lives matter also helped i would say that at this point black Lives matters may have been one of the hugest the biggest boost for us because people are really making a conscious effort to buy black i mean i'm just looking at myself also like i need new sheets for my bed i'm like okay is there a black company who does that um we're running out of dove at home and i'm like okay which black company am i going to buy soap from so i'm making I um, mean, for instance, I changed my bank account to the bank in Orlando that is black owned. I researched the bank. And then, so people are making a conscious effort and they're looking, okay, who does black chocolate? And we've been having orders nonstop. Like, seriously, nonstop orders. We can barely catch up. It's kind of like, I'll give an example. We have one big cargo with um, a thousand bars that arrive on Thursday and by Friday they were sold out. And we still have orders that are not totally fulfilled. We have we had to send two cargo. They are now the clear custom <laughs> at 3 p.m. So hoping to get them tomorrow morning, and then we're going to be shipping them for all these Father's Day order we have. So I'm saying like and. And then when, when I can check the names, I mean, is the end team, but I'm not going to say, but it's really named like the young, the child that are buying. So these are not only Haitian. Of course, you'll find some Haitian name, you'll find the Augustin and all who are buying, but you're seeing that a diversity of people really enjoying, well, really considering our brand because it's black home and that's also helping us because more sales we get more cacao we can buy we keep our employee employed because i was already thinking oh my god after these three weeks if i don't get more sales i won't be able to keep the staff because um uh, we need to make sales and the sales are really coming up with um people making a conscious effort to buy black to buy black owned black operated black managed women owned and all Awesome. Now you are a business that is based both here and in Haiti. So are you, were you able to capitalize on some of these government loans or PPE and other? Um, yeah, the, yeah. And that was a good question I had for Magali. The, the thing is that the business is 
incorporated in Haiti. And the other reason I did that purposefully is that I wanted to show that there's a business based in Haiti, not only Haitian American, but based in Haiti that has all our paper, the paper with DGE made, all the paperwork of Kitsus and all like uh, making sure that we like a business made in Haiti that I wanted to show that it was possible to have a successful business in Haiti. So this being said, I have no employee in the U.S. I have contractors, but not employee. All my employees are in Haiti. All my farmers are in Haiti. So when all these PPE, like this um, payroll protection program came, there was no one on the payroll in the U.S. So and a lot of the grants were applied for also. They are the first question they will be like, what is your payroll tax and all? And I'm like, actually, all I have in the U.S. is an LLC to help me import the chocolate. So it's an LLC with, um, with one person just to import. So unfortunately, that wasn't really helpful that way. And even some grants that they were doing either to, um, to some association here. However, what we've been able to capitalize on is like this um, loan that um, PayPal or Shopify are offering. So, which means the, 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 the capital, the, the PayPal. Yeah, the Shopify capital or the PayPal capital, exactly. And how this works is if you allow, if you um, use PayPal as a payment system or Shopify as your sales um, support system and they see how much sales that you're bringing, they will borrow you money. So they also thought that borrowing you, I don't know, 500, five, 3,000 and up. And then as sales come, they take it automatically. So it's not like you have to to like check, oh my God, am I need to pay a credit card or a payment? No, when the sales come, whatever you decide to, let's say you have a hundred dollar and it's a 30%, they take the $30 and you receive the 70. So this way it's been reimbursed and now we're getting to the point that we're getting $20,000 worth of, 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 of loan that we can use to help grow the business. So this has been helpful and I recommend others to do that. Okay. Yeah, great, great point for mentioning that. For anyone who's watching, if you do your sales, Square offers that, PayPal offers that, Shopify offers that, that I know of. Uh, I've been a PayPal user for almost 20 years since I've had my business. So I was shocked because it's really is based on your sales when I, they are always offering you loans. Yeah. Based and on also, that. yeah, and they also see the increase in this way that, okay, if they say like, oh, actually, through the money they give you, I mean, they'll ask you why you're using it and you'll tell, you'll tell them. But afterwards, when they see your sales increasing, then they borrow, they, they borrow you more. They said, oh, it's great. You were able, like, I mean, we're able to, like, last, last round we did, we're able to reimburse this in, like, six weeks. So they were, like, afterwards, they kind of quadrupled the amount they gave. Thank you so much, Corinne. So we're gonna move up. And guys, remember, reserve your questions. If anyone's watching, you have questions for all the panelists. We'll be asking that toward the end. We're going to close off our final panelist, um, Ms. Cynthia Almonasi. So can you please give us a little brief introduction about yourself and then we'll get to some of the questions. So my name is Cynthia Almonasi and um, I grew up in Haiti until I was a teenager. And then I came to the United States. And um, so in my head, I wanted to become a doctor, but I wanted to be a pediatrician. So I started going to retreats for young adults and realizing that they were having trouble at home. And when they came to the retreats, they were having a hard time going back home. So I decided to change my major into uh, the field of mental health. So then after I got my degree, I worked for 22 years in human services. And I decided to switch gear a little bit uh, to basically focus more on the mental health piece, especially in uh, Rhode Island where I live. They don't have, I mean, it's not really a lot of uh, mental health therapists that do Haitian, that's not many. I think I'm the only one, maybe one or two people, but I don't even know who they are. So uh, and I ended up joining the HAPARI, which is like uh, the Haitian American Partnership with Positive Action, which basically help with the like Haitian flag every day and help with different cultural events. Um, different things that we need to do for the community. We're there for them. So we do that every year. So I ended up joining that with the idea I will be part of the community and be able to help any Haitians with like anything they might need. And also for the mental health piece, if they need anything with that. I also write an article for a big church in Wood Island that has a lot of Haitian going there. Uh, and to explain what mental health is, 
what's the taboo about it, you know, when it comes to Haitian culture, with the idea people will get some knowledge and eventually be not afraid to come and talk about certain topics that they might want to talk about and not feel shame or guilt coming and talk about it. So uh, I basically did that. And now currently I have a private practice and I'm seeing I'm doing individual family, uh, I see children. Um, and also I work also for another, uh, well, I have another full-time job where I work as a, as a consultant actually. And the other side of the, that is that people call before the employees come uh, and call us. We have different contract, they call us. And what we do for them, we hear them, we do an assessment, see what they need. And then we will kind of direct them to the service that they need. So basically in a nutshell, that's what I do. Okay, awesome. I'm going to hit you with some mental health questions because based on some of the things that the panelists spoke about, uh, I heard social yeah. media coming up a lot, right? So my first question for you is, throughout this pandemic, everyone has relied on social media for news, entertainment, pretty much everything. Is there such a thing as information overload? And uh, and how does social media, how have social media impacted uh, individual individuals both positively and negatively? Okay. Yes, definitely there's such a thing as uh, information overload. Um, I think it's best for people to take a step back and only limit how much you listen to the news because sometimes the common reaction you see when you actually have too much information, people sometimes numb them, they get very numb, they have a hard time falling asleep and staying asleep, they have like really get very anxious, they get worried about their health, about other people, about their loved ones. They also have like a hard time with like patients. They be patients, they get angry, they get irritable. And so it's really hard for them to really focus on their daily routine. So it's better that people limit themselves to, you know, maybe one hour of knowing what you need to do. You probably could go stick to the facts, go to the government uh, website about what they're talking in terms of what you need to know for yourself. And one area, focus on that, get the information and kind of, kind of like really lessen on the other parts of information because because by my, by doing that you actually taking too much information it's not healthy for you okay awesome uh a lot of our panelists are married with children and again i mentioned this earlier Rifa spoke to it you're in this house you're in the home with everyone and you can't really go out for too much because you're stuck right so what advice would you give to families who need to get away yet couldn't how do you create that time for yourself when there's not really much room to maneuver? Perhaps it's lightening up a little yeah. bit now. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is a real good question. Uh, with this, I mean, the home becomes a lot of people, the classroom, the gym, the workplace. So it's really hard to find some areas to actually breathe because everybody's on top of each other. So self-care is very, very important for everyone. You know, I always say to people, you need to make sure that you actually have an area to do your work if you do want to work from home. An area for your children to do their work if they're going to, you know, it could be probably not too far from them so they can see that you're working, but also they have to work. So in the same time, too, have a time for everybody to take a break. So self-care could look like, okay, go for a walk as a family. You know, if you need to take time for yourself, you could probably, like, if you have a partner in the home with you, you could say, you know what? I'm gonna take a long shower, can you entertain the kids? And then we can swap, you know? Or the kids can have a virtual date with other kids, you know? So the parents can take a break having their kids have a virtual date and do that. If you feel like you can even do that, you could go to your car, sit in your car, and meditate if you do that, pray or do yoga. And there's some apps actually that help people calm down. Uh, some of them are breathe to relax. Uh, there's Headspace, there's Calm. So you could actually put those on and just find some time for you to decompose. You know, but you know, if you feel like this is not like you're still not feeling it, doing so as a family also is important. So use your partner if need be. And if you don't have a partner, use your family members and friends that you have. They can call on your kids, talk to your kids when you're taking that time to do to do for yourself what you need to do for yourself. Okay. So since we are speaking to women business owners and entrepreneurs, what issues uh, would you say came up for a lot of women, right? In terms of what especially entrepreneurial women or with both personal as well as, well not forget the personal because we spoke about that a little bit on the business front what kind of like anxiety or issues concern that you notice that a lot of women entrepreneurs were experiencing over the last three months 
Yeah. A lot of people, like, you know, they get anxious and worry that uh, they're going to be able to are they going to be able to sustain their, their business? You know, if COVID-19 is going to hit their business and not able to maintain it. So I, when I tell people is that try to worry so much, limit your worry, guess the fact, know what to do to reopen your business. You know, the government has some really strict guidelines about what to do to open your business. Stick to that. Follow it. Because if you follow, you're going to minimize the chances of catching uh, COVID-19 so you'll be able to stay open. Because the minute you catch it, it, it puts you backwards. So I tell people, worry, don't worry so much. Take a day at a time, follow the guidelines, and do as much as you can to follow it. You should follow it. And then so you don't really put yourself in that position where you have to close your business. Awesome. And then I guess finally, the, um, beyond this pandemic, over the last few weeks, we've dealt with a lot as a Black community uh, with the Ahmaud Arbery case, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. How has the resurgence of Black Lives Matter, protest, heated racial tension, all of these things impacted people's psyche overall beyond the fact that we're cooped up at home. Yeah. Yes. You are. It's almost like a, people got hit double times, you know, uh, first you have COVID, they were already feeling the top of the way. I explained that earlier. And now you have this happen. So what I'm seeing happening with people now, it's a different kind of like things that are coming up. So there's three things that people are getting PTSD from. The first one is the police brutality. The second one is the like the racial injustice they're looking on, on over and over on the screen. And the third one is like, okay, now, like what are we gonna do now, knowing that all this is happening? You know, and so there's there's like numb people get numb still, but they have a lot of flashback because of PTSD, you get a lot of flashback from that. The people, whichever one of those they get triggered by, they get flashback. They get like really, they don't want to think about whatever experience they might experience that gave them trauma to begin with. So they want to avoid that. They also have like a the fight and flee response. They feel like they lost. They feel guilty. Uh, they feel like they like, you know, disinterested. Some people feel disinterested about the whole thing. They don't want nothing to do with it because they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to really look at it. And some people have a lot of fear. They, they like a lot of fear. They feel it's hopeless, helpless. A lot of fear in the sense that the world is not a safe place anymore. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Cynthia. Uh, again, yeah. if you're watching, you can ask your questions. I mean, I have some overall questions for uh, all of you ladies. Anyone can start and answer. Maybe two or three of you can take on the questions. But I guess perhaps my one of the overarching questions I have in all of this is... Uh, on the business front, what is the, if you were to say in like one minute or less, what's been the ultimate lesson that you've learned over the last, from this experience? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> okay, I'll start. Well, I would say, is that, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess I, I, I would say adaptability. Um, I'm realizing like, you know, like people who are able to just pivot immediately with no regrets and no shame have been doing really well. Cause I think there's a lot of pride and ego and um, a lot of bit of embarrassment when you put yourself out there, but high risk, high reward. And so if you put yourself out there as a business owner and just pivot very quickly and adapt it very quickly, it really helps. I and mean, we were looking at, you know, this conversation about PPE loans and grants. The people who made it on that first wave, they got the money quickly. Now they have more stringent, you know, requirements for these applications that are going live now. So I think, you know, adaptability is the number one word to describe 2020 and just being ready to just like try to create as much adjustments as quickly as possible. Um, it's been amazing to see the businesses be resilient this year with this. No, I love that. And I always speak to the entrepreneur, you basically have to be an innovator is really the word I associate with uh, entrepreneurship and innovation and innovate quickly. And that goes right along with adaptability for me. Uh, anyone else want to tackle that question before we move on yeah. to some uh, other questions? Um, I just wanted yeah. to add. You, you probably have to be creative. About, yeah, I would say you probably have to be creative about how you do things. Because Yeah. I was going to also say that um, I find that balance is also um, a really important um, aspect because 
as a creative, we yes, we have to hit hit it while it's hot. Strike strike the iron while it's hot. We have to get our ideas out. We have to implement, but also not to um, wear ourselves too thin so that we're not sort of burning, um, you know, the candle at both ends. Which is actually what happened to me initially. I went so hard, and then I was like wait a minute, I need to say no to a few of these performances. I need to slow down these expectations. I need to be clear with my clientele about, you know, what the turnaround time will be. You have to be also gentle with yourself because we can't, you know, we can't give from an empty cup. So, um, so yeah, I would say balance is a big one. Beautiful. We have a lot of questions from the audience. One of the first one was, how do you go about transitioning from this to, I guess, a new normal. Is there such a thing as a new normal? How do you transition back to normalcy? Well, they say the best, you know, people that are ready for the future are the ones who create it, right? One of the first things that we did in our family and all, both in our business is that we created best case scenario mid case scenario and worst case scenario. So I had all three scenarios before I even opened the news channels because one thing I would say is prior to COVID-19, we didn't look at the news as much. And now you're seeing people are glued to the TV 24 seven. It is bad for you. If you used to just check the news when you went off to go to work and when you come back, try to maintain that sense of reality in your home because being at home, you're gonna get used to gluing yourself to too much media and it's flashing breaking news every two minutes. I don't even think the news know the difference anymore between breaking news and just normal news anymore. Everything is always breaking. So I think for us, you know, to get to that new normal, the new normal is gonna be defined by how you define it. And the best way to prepare for it is create that normal for yourself. If you created the best case scenario for what would 2020, 2021 look for, you're ready for the worst case scenario because you already mapped it out. It's almost like a movie. If you watched a movie already, you're not scared of the ending. And I think a lot of people need to prepare themselves. It's like, look at all the scenarios as possible. And when you see the worst case scenario, maybe it might be everyone in the household is unemployed. And that's not going to be capital for several months. Once you mentally put that on paper, what does that look like? Well, I could probably, you know, room up with, you know, family. Maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do that. Once you plan for all scenarios, you're not going to be caught off guard when it actually happens. And keep in mind, when you plan for the worst, you're prepared for the best as well. And so it's a balancing that. Just make sure you plan it out. And just always remember that quote. Those who, um, you know, create the future are the ones who are best prepared for it. Because, you know, you have to have faith during this time. I do think that a lot of people who guide themselves by faith and just believe that this too shall pass, keep in mind, we've been through pandemics before. The 1930s, we've been through a Great Depression before. We have seen it all. PMM beings are a lot more predictable than you think. So this too shall pass. And as teachers, we know that we are Christian first because of many values. So keep the faith and know that you will get on the other side and have a story to tell your kids, your grandkids, and all those who come after you. Okay, uh, we have another question here. Is how do you, you how do you as an entrepreneur determine how to respond or not respond to matters such as the Black Lives Matter and the, and not simply capitalize off of the moment? Any of you can answer this, but personally, I think Corinne said a very important thing in her discussion about how she's benefited from it. But one of the things that that really caught my attention is the fact that she says she's of the same mindset. She's looking for her sheets from a black business owner. She's looking for the soap from a black business owner. So I think to the extent that it is coming from a genuine place, there should be no guilt or for capitalizing as a business on it. But you guys, someone else can answer as well. Anyone? All right. For, well, I just... I just Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Cynthia. Please do. I was going to say, from, from the mental health piece of it, uh, and then we'll go to Corinne. Go ahead, Cynthia. I would say, from the mental health piece of it, it's hard not to because people are coming to you because they're being triggered by the by those by the events, you know. So it's hard not to serve them, and 
uh, and to be able to help. So it's hard to say, I'm not going to really work and help you because this is going to benefit me. So for the mental health piece, I have to help them because they're in trouble. They're not themselves. They want to be better. So my business are picking up because of that. I have a lot of people emailing me, calling me. I'm feeling this way. I'm feeling that way. Can you help? So it's hard for me to say no because of the work that I do. Corinne? Okay. Yes, I was unmuting myself. Um, so what I'll, what I'll say regarding um, being genuine with it about it is the way I see it is kind of like for us at Ascania, our goal first is not only to create delicious chocolate, it's to also make a difference in Haiti. So helping our employee who are mostly black women, women and black women, Haitian women, helping the farmers who are black farmers, Haitian farmers. So if someone right now, if you want to translate it to like not only Black Lives Matter, BLM in the US, but also to all the black diaspora, um, supporting my business is also is not only supporting a black business, but it's supporting farmers. It's supporting the whole ecosystem where if the farmers in Haiti can leave um, of their crops, they don't become both people, they can live with dignity, they can um, support themselves. And it's the same way also I see it when, I, when I'm when i buying a black, my black sheets or my, my black soap, I'm not just buying it because it's black made, but also I'm expecting to have a good quality soap. So it's not only, um, it's not only the BLM being only, we, yes, we're helping a black business in the sense that we're helping someone um, that is a minority that has, as an have given a lot of opportunity or equal opportunity, a chance to, to blossom, but it's also me getting a good product. So it's a, it's kind of like a double bottom or d double view where you're getting a good product, but it's also made by a minority. I just want to put a quick comment on this as well for the Black Lives Matter movement. I want to remind people to just go global as well, because a lot of times when you're thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement, you're seeing what's happened outside your door. Never have we seen such a massive globalized conversation around Black people and how we should really care about the future of how we talk about Black people in the systematic legacy that has been created for the past century. Right now, as we speak, I'm five hours ahead of you. I'm in London right now. And I have never seen the ecosystem of London across Germany. Germany hosted its largest protest it's ever had in its history for the Black Lives Matter movement. So one thing to always think about, don't just look at the Black Lives Matter movement just within your backyard and your community. How do you as an entrepreneur tap into the global community? Because there are people across the African continent that's protesting, there's people across the Caribbean that's uh, protesting, there's people across Europe that's protesting. The world is standing up for us. And as far as taking advantage, if there was a system of oppression to get, go against black people, now's the time to leverage it and stand up and take advantage. Of it. So that's what I think it's something you should be proud of, that now people see black businesses as something that they should tap into first because of how the system was. And that's you also thinking about this global base that you can tap into now as entrepreneurs on this call. So I think we should also look at how the global response is um, is reacting to this and how you as an entrepreneur can tap into that global conversation around the Black Lives Matter movement as well. Awesome, awesome. We have a question from Adler and I guess we can ask the women on the panel since you are all Haitian women businesses. And then the second part, I think, can be perhaps addressed separately to NAHP and any other organization that's dealing with businesses as a whole, maybe chambers of commerce. The question goes, does Haitian women-owned businesses know how to take advantage of the CARES Act Paycheck Protection Program, Small Business Administration? How do we make sure that all Haitian and diaspora business owners take advantage of the loan? So you guys are all mm -hmm. businesses. Let's start with you all. So I think I mentioned it earlier that my business is actually Haiti based. So we are not registered here in the US. We're not an LLC or incorporated. So it was, we were not qualified because these loans were for US businesses and we don't have any employee here. Uh, the con 
what's happening to a lot of small business also in the u.s is like they are one person type of business so it was mostly like so it was difficult for a lot of them to capitalize on that because usually i think one of the requirement is like you shouldn't be the only like a one person llc and all so that affected a lot of business option i mean some business small business owner small women own but i know of many who took advantage of it so that will be my my two cents can i clarify that because I, I brought it up during my talk in the very beginning actually it's not just attracting small business owners it's also attracting freelancers and contract workers so let's be very clear that people are aware that whether you're a small business person with one employee and by the way that one employee can be yourself by the way or multiple yeah. employees you could capitalize on that i think the most important thing is that people need to sign up for sba.gov they have automatic webinars on this right now where they're having these sessions, they're on demand, we could go on it and just follow the sessions and they'll walk you through. They even have accountants who are doing YouTube videos to walk you through how to do the application. So if you are still looking at the information, you're getting overwhelmed, go to sba.gov, they have webinar sessions for you to track it. Second, if you go to our site at globalstartupecosystem.com, we have one of the largest databases of daily live updates on all the COVID-19 grants loans and resources and announcements from corporate programs that are being announced for COVID-19 relief as it stands every single day on a daily basis. But I do want to remind people that you need to just go and start. Some of them, for example, the disaster relief fund, the 10K grant, took less than five to 10 minutes to apply. It was five basic pages. A lot of people didn't apply because they felt that they didn't have the taxes in order. They'll get to documents yeah, after, but just apply. Because one thing that we're doing is that we feel like we're not perfect enough for the application and we don't put the application in. Don't make the excuse, just put it in. Again, trial and error, you'll figure it out or use the sba.gov webinar series to track it. You spend time on YouTube, you spend time on TikTok, you're watching all the fun videos, let's empower ourselves and just take the time. It may not be the funnest thing to watch, but it's gonna help your business. $1,000, $5,000 could go a long way for anyone who has a business or is a freelancer or contractor during this time. Awesome. Okay, and then I guess the final question I have, somebody, well, not final, someone asked, who should attend the Haiti Tech Summit? Is it for someone, is it good for someone who's in the research development stage of business or is it more for someone who's already in business or investors? Haiti Tech Summit has a diverse audience. We have entrepreneurs, we have creatives, we have non-tech enthusiasts, we have small business owners. It is a culmination program that brings all the influences together from across the diaspora, around the world, and across Haiti to come together. And what they do is talk about the future of the country by leveraging technology. So you have 10 different industries represented every single year in medicine. We have one of the, the, by the way, we've been doing industry disruption announcements of influencers across Haiti every single year in different spaces in medical, education, and energy. So it's a very diverse audience. The point is, what do you believe right now in the future of Haiti? Are you thinking Haiti first? Are you proud to be Haitian? Are you proud to talk about the beauty of our culture, the beauty of like, you know, our businesses and what's the potential of our future nation? These are the conversations that we have. And we had very difficult conversations, but very aspiring conversations at Haiti Tech Summit. So it's open to all, both local and international. It's one of the biggest summits. And I challenge you to definitely look us up and come through for sure. So Dr. Uh, Almonasi, uh, someone asked, any advice for an aspiring black therapist who would be prepared to start their own practice in about two years? On the business side, what would be important to focus on right now if they are Great ready question. two years? <laughs> I, uh, yes, I would say preparing for that. So it depends exactly where are you in your education, but because the only way you'll be able to get panel to any health insurance, you have to be at least have your license. So what you probably could do is preparing by studying and getting all your credits, all your classes due, pass your license, depending if you're a licensed mental health or a licensed social worker. So they all have different criteria, different things you need to do. So preparing that is important. And when you finally get your license now, 
then you can try panel to the different health insurance because they all have different criteria and it takes some time sometimes you know depending if they're looking for therapists at the time so doing that's important so you can actually get all your you know everything in in, in gear and then when you're ready actually to get licensed um to get the panel you can actually apply to different health insurance and it's easy as a uh uh, a therapist to be able to find any a job you could do online now because a lot of people are doing telehealth right now you could actually get your own place and then do that basically who's paying you is the health insurance the minute you get panel to health insurance you can actually get started getting paid or you can also ask people for cash but a lot of people are using the health insurance so i would say the next two years it's good to get all your credits in place pass your license depending on what uh area you're going to whether it's licensed mental health or licensed social worker or it could be like a psychologist it could be any of those so get that done first get licensed then panel yourself to the health insurance then you can get paid that way so that would be what i would say to do thank you so much everyone uh this has been phenomenal i i'm so grateful to the five of you that were able to join us i think we had one fine oh i thought there was a final question but uh, we could put up that last question uh, from Jody Lynn, and then I'll close out real briefly. We've briefly with what uh, what's next. Have you noticed higher rates of disordered eating in your practice during this uncertain time period with depression and obesity going hand in hand? I'm assuming doctor, that's uh, I have to say, I have to say, depression definitely. I have one client who has obesity, but that didn't come from COVID nineteen. Uh, or even for what's going on with the Black Lives Matters. So it depends on the person. Uh, but what I'm seeing more is anxiety, worry. Uh, that's basically what I'm doing. A lot of people are getting PTSD, uh, flashback. Uh, they can fall asleep. They can they can eat. They can stay asleep. So I'm seeing more of that. If you already have, uh, you, you find yourself eating more, it's because you probably have a coping skill that when you don't feel okay about what's going on, you resort to eating. So that's already already there. So then you kind of comfort comfort yourself with some, with, you know, by eating. If that's what something that helps you. That's your coping skill. So that helps you. That's why you probably see that. But that's already was there. But depression definitely, anxiety, worry, PTSD definitely. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Almonasi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you, Christine. Christine, I know it's way past your bedtime. Thank you so much for staying up with us. Hopefully, you were chugging down that coffee. Uh, looking forward to Tech Summit in October. I, I, I can't wait to attend. I've heard so many amazing, positive things. And Askania, you know I need my dark chocolate, so napale after. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but just wanted to say thank you again. And I want to close off, you know, by reminding everyone, please fill out the survey that um, is in all the platforms uh, so we can get some feedback in terms of uh, the symposium. Uh, NAHP, I think one of the questions was in terms of ensuring Haitian American communities informed, whether it's about PPE or other information, that's what they strive for. Just a little brief um, information for those of you that just logged on, because maybe you know Christine, maybe you know Corinne, maybe you know Cynthia, but NAHP is dedicated. You know, it's a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and it really was established by a diverse group of forward thinking industry experts, youth leaders, faculty, and public and nonprofit sector global professionals who are dedicated to seeing the professional advancement of Haiti and the diaspora. So the core mission is really exactly what we're doing now. Each year, the core objective is to keep Haitian communities updated, informed through constant communication and collaboration in order to achieve a positive collective and sustained impact. So as you have ideas, as you have thoughts, as you are in, being impacted by different things, we at NAHP would like to know. They want to know your thoughts. They want to know what you want to hear about because their very mission speaks to that. And we are very, very glad you were able to join us. Let me double check one with, with the group, make sure I said everything. Well, I would love to thank you too, Nadesh, for being a fantastic moderator. And again, I would like to congratulate the team who put up this, um, from Molina Jean-Louis to Anatali to Francesca. So great job, ladies. We're here. It was all ladies too. <laughs> involved in this and then of course congrats um, thank you to nhp thank you thank you to just you know the chairperson for giving us that platform to share our experiences as women entrepreneurs
Tell our fine. Hey. <laughs> I would like to say also thank you to uh for everyone. I learned a lot today from all of you guys uh being here, ladies. Um, and thank you to uh, uh, HP for inviting me to talk about mental health, which is a, such a big thing um, in, our, in the Haitian culture because it's such a taboo thing to talk about. So thank you for inviting me. So hopefully some people learn from this and people will be open more to it and to actually reach for someone after you and me talk about it. Hopefully that will inspire you to do that. So thank you for inviting me to this and, and to be able to speak about that. And thank you, wonderful ladies, for being here. And I've learned so much from you. Yeah, and of course, I want to echo the ladies. First off, thank you to the panelists because you guys like always remind me of like the powerful women that we have in our ecosystem. And so, thank you so much for inspiring me. Huge thank you to you, Nadia. You moderated this so beautifully. Thank you so much for your energy, your spirit. You brought out the best out of all of us. And a huge, huge thank you to NAHP. You guys have always been pioneers in the Haitian community, bringing us together. Thank you so much for your leadership as always. We always, always appreciate you. If you don't hear enough, thank you so much for this time. It was an honor, everyone. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, NAHP, Francesca Andre, Atali Ekayo, and then Molina Jolie. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening and be safe. <laughs>